It is the Practical Prayer Podcast on New Thought Media Network with uh, Bill over here and Carol over there. And it's an auspicious day, an auspicious day, because uh, in addition to being uh, a week into um, the Mercury retrograde, which has nothing to do with New Thought, uh, today is also uh, a solar eclipse. So, Carol, it, yeah. it looked for a second like you do not... Uh, you're you're not read in on Mercury retrograding. Um, yeah, yeah. I was introduced. First of all, I need to put it on my calendar. I usually don't. So <laughs> like the two or three days April. into it, when I'm going completely nuts because some stuff is not working, that should easily easily be working. It dawns on me it's the retrograde. So I go to Google, get the dates, and say, duh, like you're in the middle of this thing. So yep. guess what? I'm on it now. I've put it on my calendar through the end of this year and the first quarter of next year. Not to be caught yeah. again. Oh, okay. yeah. I got surprised by it this time. No. That's just me. So, uh, but as, as I mentioned, that's not the big news for today. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to start by saying hello to everybody who's joining us on New Thought Media Network. It is wonderful to have you with us. And uh, we're going to record an episode of the Practical Prayer podcast in a couple of minutes. And um, in the meantime, what you can do is you can put a comment into your social media chat uh, and uh, or comments. And we can respond to that, whether it's a prayer request, a question, a suggestion, an observation, uh, or you know, some whatever you can put that in there uh, if you are watching on the recordings you could go to the website at be the light.com b the light.com and there's a section for the practical prayer podcast there and there is a similar comment button on the website so that you can communicate with us uh, out of band as they say and it, what we would like to be able to do is engage in a way that's going to be meaningful and uh, and and lift folks up so with that said, this is a somewhat interactive, and we're going to stop being interactive when we start recording the episode in a couple of minutes. But yeah, today is uh, uh, the last solar eclipse in North America for quite some time, and actually the last one on Earth for quite some time. And we're going to talk about that in the episode, because it's either a big deal or it's not, and we're going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Should we explain I think Mercury retrograde? It's a retrograde? pretty big deal. I, well, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. Explain it, and then because a lot of people don't understand it or don't believe it, you don't have to. It's still working. Well, yeah. So basically, Mercury retrograde. Um, all of the planets in our solar system orbit around the sun, and when because we're on planet Earth and we're orbiting around the sun. Basically, the platform from which we're looking at the other planets is moving. And because we're moving at a different speed than the other planets, they move in the sky in relation to our platform here on Earth. For the planets that are inside the orbit of Earth, it's possible as they're going around the sun faster than we are, at some point it looks like they're going backwards. And it's not because they're actually going backwards. They're continuing to go in a circle, but we're overtaking them in our orbit. We're going faster the angular motion is different, so it looks like they're going backwards. So most planets just go around and around like this. And retrograde goes around, it goes, looks like it's going this way, and it stops a little bit, does a little jiggle, and it comes, continues around. Fascinating. That's, that's a fascinating little data point. doesn't mean anything. Except for the correlation. It turns out that when Mercury is in retrograde, communications get screwed up. It's the cell phone doesn't work, and that happened to me today. My cell phone, uh, the radio on my cell phone just wasn't working. It was on SOS only. It's the first time it's done that in a month or two. Um, and people are saying, <laughs> I did a wedding for some brides a couple, of, like six months ago, and they suddenly came out of the woodwork saying, we haven't gotten our paperwork. And I said, oh, well, something happened with the courthouse. Contact the courthouse. They said, You owe us the paperwork. And I said, I don't have the paperwork. I'm not allowed to. This is Pennsylvania. You have to get it from the court. They said, We expect it from you. <laughs> Send us our paperwork. <laughs> it's like, Hello, I don't have your paperwork. You need to contact the court. They said, We don't even know if we're married. It's like, Here's a screenshot from the county website showing that you're married and that they mailed you your thing in October. So, can you please just contact them? Hello, shouting down a well. So, it's Mercury retrograde. 
And we all have stories about that. Yeah. I you had it. one today. You have a neighbor who I... is lo loves to communicate and knows that you record this program every Monday mm -hmm. and that you're not available on Monday. And what does she do on Monday, right before the recording? Send me a text or a call or call, text, voicemail. So it seems urgent. But how many episodes are we in? Number 148 today. That seems to be enough for somebody to remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're coming up on three years of this, so it's possible that said neighbor could remember. But anyway, that's Mercury retrograde. And I mentioned that magical piece, which is causation or correlation. And that's a really interesting thing in science, because it is very easy to observe things that are going on and say, ah, the, 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 the weather is getting warmer and the sun is coming up earlier. So when the weather gets warm, it makes the sun come up earlier. It's like, like no, no, basically based on orbital mechanics, the sun comes up earlier, that makes it warmer. And we know that, but it's possible to look at it and just understand we have this data point and that data point and they correlate with each other, even though it's not necessary that they, one of them causes the other or the one that we think is doing the causing is actually doing it. So yeah. um, that's kind of the magic of, of, of observation is we can be so wrong in our conclusions, even though we're so accurate in our observations. Yeah. Lots of times. Thinking it out. Lots of times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you want to get into the that's episode? Why a lot of times. Oh, no, mm -hmm. I was just going to say that a lot of times. That's why I always say start out with me. It's probably me. So let me look at the facts of what's going on here, because, you know, yep. I've been wrong Don, a lot. Don Miguel Ruiz, said, one of his agreements is don't make assumptions. And if I, if I make the assumption that I know what's happening, I'm probably wrong. And, um, and, and then what happens next? It's time for fun. <laughs> Let's do a podcast episode. <laughs> A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Reverend Bill is a new thought minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the new thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is New Thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. Hi. Hello there. And so uh, we are recording this episode of the podcast on the day of the solar eclipse. And if you are watching or listening to this podcast uh, in its later renditions, you might vaguely remember that there's a solar eclipse in April of 2024 in North America. Or you may not remember that. Or you may not care about that. Uh, but the reason that we're going to talk about it is because that's kind of the way new thought works. Things happen and we have an, an, an engagement and interaction and understanding of them. And uh, what it means to us actually has some meaning. Hmm. Yeah. So the eclipse, I remember when I was real little. I don't know, like really, really in elementary school, I think we had one like this. Mm hmm and we weren't supposed to look at the sun and they had, they were creating all kind of little things for you to use to look at the sun. And it was, I don't remember, it was cones and all kind of stuff, you know. And thing made out of a couple of cardboard boxes that you put your head into. Yeah, yeah, this, this stuff. And I, I remember being so confused by trying to get it done and the threat of going blind if you don't. <laughs> If you don't get it right, I remember thinking, like, listen, this is not worth it because I don't have, you know, good eyesight to begin with. I'm nearsighted. 
So I thought, I don't see good on a, on the best day. I'm not messing with this. I remember being a little kid thinking that. And so now today, I'm thinking, I never saw an eclipse except for a picture, and that's all it will ever be. Well, uh, it depends okay. on how you look, look at these, you know, the extent that you'll go to be able to see it. That's actually a wonderful metaphor for the way that we engage in the world, because it is possible for somebody's eyesight to be damaged by a solar eclipse. And then there's the voodoo that surrounds that, which is like, oh, if I go outside during a solar eclipse, my vision is going to be damaged. So I should stay indoors. I should hide from it. I should watch it on television. I should make sure that I'm nowhere near the, the, the solar eclipse light because there's something evil or malevolent about it. And that's not true. <laughs> you know what? I, I didn't know this, but I was reading about it and it was like a lot of witchcraft, the, the negative kind of witchcraft, not the good stuff, but the mm -hmm. negative kind was all wrapped up in it. And I thought, you know, I'm not, I can't say whether it's right or wrong because people believe whatever they want, but things, you kind of make it be what you want it to be, it seems, you know? Like, yep. I, yeah. I, I, you notice how slow I was about saying that because. Yeah. I remember the same solar eclipse you're talking about when I was a kid and it was undoubtedly the same one because you were in Philadelphia and I was in North Jersey. And so that's the, the similar one that's happening. And we built the same contraption in our house so that we could look through the, 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 the projected image. And it was interesting because you had to make sure that your head wasn't in the way of the picture of the, of the sun. And the, the mailman came by during the eclipse and my dad met him outside and says, you're not looking at the, uh, at the eclipse, are you? And the mailman said, no, that's the reason I'm wearing glasses is because I did that when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been going on for a while. Long time. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to take off the religious science hat and put on the science hat. And here's why here, here's how the solar eclipse can hurt somebody's eyes. So when the eclipse happens, it's basically the shadow of the moon. Uh, coming, that's, that's what makes it dark. So the moon is coming between the sun and the earth. Now, normally we don't look at the sun and we certainly don't stare at the sun because it is what? Too bright. That's right. It's too bright to look at. It will, it will hurt our eyes that it actually hurts to try and look at it. So we don't, but during a solar eclipse, it's fascinating. So we are intrigued by that and we want to see what's going on. So we tend to look at the sun and say, oh, what is that? And then it turns out that the amount of light that's coming off the sun is much less than it usually is. So it is possible to look at it. So our usual squint, look away reaction goes away. But not all of the sunlight gets blocked. There's usually you know, that little diamond ring thing that's there. That's as bright as the sun ever is. And the way that our eyes work is the sun, the, the light comes down and it gets focused by our cornea, which is the lens, and it lands somewhere on our retina. And during an eclipse, most of our retina is not getting any light, but that one little tiny part that is, mm -hmm. it's still looking straight at the sun. So yeah. that's actually why it's bad to look straight at the sun during an eclipse or any time. It's just nobody thinks of doing it other times. That just makes so perfect sense. You know, now I, as many times as I, or as often as I remember the eclipse story and the experience, nobody ever explained it. I don't remember anybody explaining it like that. It's just, you don't look at it. Don't and look I at it, it's dangerous, sense. it's scary, bad voodoo. <laughs> yeah, the voodoo part. And I mean, you know, you don't know science, but common sense tells you there's still a little sunlight coming through. Maybe you men shouldn't mess with it and just leave it alone. But without a really good scientific explanation, you can just go all over the place with this and anything else, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I'm not no poo poo on interpretations and all of that business. But I do kind of like the scientific Meth, um, you know, explanation for a lot of things. I kind of feel, you know, comfortable with that. Well, although mm -hmm. from the side of the street I come from, yeah, you don't have the, science and religion at the same table trying to talk. But well, you have them me. both working together, and they're just fine until there's a disagreement. In well, which case, yeah, it, but, it it becomes blasphemy. But the conversation doesn't get very far 
car before you get a disagreement. <laughs> I don't know who uh, you've been talking you remember, to, but I'm you remember the good I old know. days when the Earth was flat and was, and, and then when it was round, it was the center of the universe. Ah, the good old days. Why can't we? Yeah. Why can't we have those again? I think I don't remember when. Um, I'm, they call them flat earthers now. That I don't know if that's a new term, but I remember when they talked about it, and I thought, could people have really believed that? Because it just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But there's still people who believe that. Well, that's the shocker, you know, because I'm thinking that doesn't make any sense. But then I realized or was told later in reading that there are people who believe that. And I suppose they can explain it their side as well as others, you know, can explain. It. I don't know. You could take them, the, the non-believers, up to the International Space Station and have them orbit the Earth in 90 minutes and they still wouldn't believe it. And it has nothing to do with observation. It has nothing to do with the facts. It has to do with belief. Belief is really strong. Belief is really yeah. powerful. Yeah. I heard a great explanation of how it's impossible that the Earth is flat. And that is because the Earth is inhabited with cats. And if the Earth were actually flat, by now the cats would have pushed everything off the edge. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you know, and that's as likely as anything else. <laughs> you know what? Um, I, I, everybody knows I hang out at the ocean every chance I get. Yep. And my husband was just saying one time, you know, he said, you know, we live on the edge of the earth. And it was just funny to hear him say that because he is a scientist. Like, that's his background and all of that. And I looked at him, and I understood what he was saying. From where we're standing, you certainly can feel like you're on the edge of the earth. And you couple that with talking to God at the same time from being on the edge of the earth. Hey, you can start mm -hmm. a whole new religion on that if you want to. So oh, yeah. it it depends on what you believe, really. And it would that's probably the sort of religion that would be relatively easy to get people into because it all happens at the beach. The mm -hmm. edge of the earth that your husband is talking about. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the edge of the ocean, the edge of the earth. That's where the two of them meet. And there's a little dance they do back and forth that we call waves and tides. But it's always pretty much at the same place. And so, yeah, I, I love his uh, his explanation. Spent a fair amount of time as a scuba diver. And so the edge of the earth is, stretches out a little bit farther for scuba divers than it does for everybody else. Because <laughs> we can go underneath the ocean part and there's still interesting stuff to do there. Can you, your imagination can just completely run crazy. For exa example, did you feel the, the earthquake the other day that we had? <laughs> my, my daughter gets angry when people ask that question. It was an earthquake. What do you mean, did you feel it? And the yeah. fact of the matter is, I did not feel it. I was in the basement grooming the dog with like the vibrating clipper in my hand and the washing machine was going thugga 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 making everything shake anyway and there was a dehumidifier going this and zing, zing, zing. so everything was kind of in motion anyway and my wife runs downstairs everything is shaking and I said what do you mean she said come up here everything's shaking the glasses are making this tinkling noise so I get enough stuff taken care of that the dog is not going to freak out and jump off the grooming table and I walk upstairs and of course it's over and so I didn't feel a thing so, no, I didn't. And it's the second one that I was in that I didn't feel. I was in an elevator the previous time, and it just felt like a bumpy elevator ride, and it turns out the earthquake happened while we were in the elevator at an Ikea. Yeah. <laughs> well, this one... Okay, so I'm going to give you and everybody a chance to laugh, right? I'm okay. feeling... <laughs> I'm feeling the quake, and... I'm dead into my work, and I was recording something. And I felt it, and I thought, mm, that a tr truck is passing. But then that's what happens when you live in Philly. The trucks pass, the windows vibrate. I thought, mm -hmm. you don't live in Philly. What is this? And I thought, <laughs> well, let me just change positions as though that was going to address the problem. And I kept feeling it, and I just got right back into my work until I noticed the computer screen. <laughs> <laughs> vibrate. And I hmm. thought, uh, maybe something's going on here. But by the time I figured it out, it was over. Forgot completely about it until maybe an hour or so later. I thought, why don't you go check on Don, see if he's okay. 
Don's my husband, everybody. <laughs> so Power. I scoot, Snap into action. I, I scoot down there to see how he's doing, just like you. He said he didn't feel anything. He didn't know a thing about it. <laughs> Nothing. In fact, uh, he didn't ask when, no questions. He just kept doing what he was doing. Nope. Yeah, you know, no I, figure. You know? The, you know, everybody getting text messages. Did you feel that? You know, and the interesting observation that you had that you try moving to see if it goes away and that can work, but you would have had to move to like Toledo <laughs> where, where they didn't feel it. Uh, and that's another example but, 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 of something that happens and then we have an interaction with what happens and we can ascribe meaning to the interaction, whether the original thing has something to do with it or not. Exactly. And you talked about um, beliefs. And, and you can almost see how different beliefs start. Because um, I wrote about the earthquake, of course, <laughs> afterwards. And the idea is that it depends on where you were and what you were thinking. Because I talked to a lot of people, uh, you know, people checking in and making sure everybody was okay. Some people were laughing. Some people were scared to death. You mm -hmm. know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not inclined to be scared. And I thought... Hmm. But I had to speak to each person where they were. Right. So it was so different speaking to a person who was afraid as opposed to who was being a jokester about it. And, <laughs> or your husband who didn't feel yeah, it at all. Yeah, or who didn't know a thing. So it might be um, not a whole lot of space in between times that I spoke to people. And, and when I got finished, I thought, it's all about what you believe when something mm -hmm. happens. That belief kicks in. And that's your truth. But that's not the truth, you know, and... <laughs> well, we're heading into the metaphysics of this now, aren't we? I, yeah, but, you know, but how do you not get there? Because... Well, that's, that's what there is. So I think it's great to get there. Let's take a break, and then we will talk about the meaning of a solar eclipse or an earthquake, and then what the meaning means. Oh, okay. <laughs> Get inspiration in an instant. God Calls are the gentle and uplifting moment of truth to help you remember that the bright light of God's love is shining right now as you. It's your God Call with Reverend Bill. Start your two-week free trial today and you'll get a phone call four times a week from Reverend Bill with an uplifting half-minute message filled with insight, wisdom, story, and fun. Let your light shine. You can answer the call to listen to it live or let it go to voicemail so you can hear it later. After the free trial, your subscription is just $5.95 a month. The details are at godcall.org. God calls are disruptive, intentionally. Whenever you write something, put on a gold star. They take you away from your routine to remind you about the truth of who you really are. They come at random times between 8.15 a.m. and 6 p.m., so you won't be expecting them. And somehow, the message is exactly what you need to hear at the time. Magic is loose in the world. It's a moment of motivation in the middle of your day. Find out more and start your two-week free trial now at GodCall.org. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Rev. Dr. Bill Marcioni. We're talking about earthquakes and solar eclipses and what they mean and what they don't mean. Uh, mm. Because these things happen. This is, this is the way of the universe. Because we are independent and conscious beings, we are aware of our circumstances, we have a memory, so we know what's happened previously, and we have our uh, intellectual faculties, so we can put the pieces together and kind of project what may be happening in the future. We can get fooled. We can, oh, <laughs> that is such fertile ground for being surprised by things. So uh, recently, uh, an earthquake, and uh, today there's actually, we're going to be having a solar eclipse. And it's possible to attach meaning to those that goes well beyond what's actually going on. And I'm remembering the Mark Twain novel, uh, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. So there's this... Uh, uh, this guy in 1912, a mechanic who gets bonked on the head or something, and he winds up back in King Arthur's court, and they figure that he's a wizard, so they're going to burn him at the stake or whatever. And he happens to remember that the date that they're doing that is the day that there's going to be a solar eclipse. 
So he uses the, the knowledge that there's going to be a solar eclipse to tell the court, you better not do anything to me or I'll take the sun away. And they go, you can't do that. And he says, give me eight minutes. And they wait and it gets dark. And it's like, uh-oh, make the sun come back. And he knows how long the eclipse is going to last. He says, no, no, you're going to sit here in the dark for a while. And you're just going to have to wait. And they did, and they were all kind of panicky because they thought that what was going on is that this wizard was taking the sunlight away. And in fact, it was just somebody who knew something. And he said, okay, behave yourselves and I'll let the sun come back. And of course, the shadow of the moon went back past and the, the light came back. And everybody was completely relieved that the wizard was not using his wizardly power to destroy them. The only wizardly power he had was the knowledge that there was going to be an eclipse that day. Right. Okay, so with that in mind, <laughs> what, is, what does an eclipse mean? Well, if you know it's coming and nobody else does, it means that you have a wonderful opportunity to maneuver the circumstances. And if everybody else knows that it's going to be happening and you don't, then there's a possibility of getting surprised or hoodwinked. An earthquake is different. Nobody knows that it's coming. But then you get into mm. why, oh, it happened because of the evil people who are living there. It happened because of this political party or that political party. It happened because it's this far from Donald Trump's golf course or that far from the, where they're doing fracking in northeastern Pennsylvania. You can ascribe any reasons that you want to it and use that to bolster your opinion, to make your side writer. And mm -hmm. what's actually going on? is the tectonic plates in the earth are shifting for whatever reason they're shifting they do and they stop you know and the shadow of the moon is happens to cross the earth in a particular place and then it good, good passes like all shadows do and what it means is there was an eclipse <laughs> that's it now okay see this is this is awful no it's not that's why i didn't have such a welcome seat at the table on the other side <laughs> of the street <laughs> you know because i i listen i was an only child for like six years so there was nothing for me to do but read that's just it and <laughs> my parents were really because i mean listen back there in those days you had three six and ten twelve mm -hmm. didn't come and do you know, channel. So it was nothing to do but read. And I was never allowed to read comic books. So I read a lot of different stuff that, you know, kids probably didn't read. So it's really difficult for me to have accepted a lot of things that were shoved at me because there's a logical explanation for things. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't, I'm not poo-pooing the idea that you can put spiritual spiritual interpretations and other kinds of interpretations on things, but um, know that's what you're doing. You know, like right. make an analogy as opposed to a belief. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It it ex we can explain it looking at this natural thing. We can give meaning to it as though it were an example or an analogy of something, as opposed to saying, well, this is the reason it happened because it's near Donald Trump's whatever. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, if you do that, the earth would never stop shaking because right. he's not the only person that people don't feel favorably about. So then what's going to happen? You know, I mean, he's just the one that's most popular right now that, that people hate. But, you know, he's... And, and, that, and that changes. And yeah. that, that changes routinely. Uh, a friend of mine has actually some expertise in total eclipses. And I think he's been in five total eclipses. He's actually arranged to be um, in the, the, the path of totality five times uh, previously. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where if you haven't been in a total eclipse, and I've been in a partial eclipse several times, uh, but I haven't been in a total eclipse. And the people who have been in a total eclipse say it's different. And I can say, well, what makes it different? And they can explain it and they can use words and they can describe it. But what they're describing is the feeling that they have when something happens that's out of the ordinary. And 
as much as I understand that until I do it, I won't really know what they're talking about until I have that same visceral feeling myself. What makes this different? What's, you know, this is, it's not like it's dark, the night, night, nighttime dark. It's eerie dark in the middle of the day. And what does this mean? And there, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a personal experience of some of a global astronomical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where, uh, to me, the science gets respect. Uh, and, and maybe that's a safe way to put it. And if from the other side of the street, I'll say, I'll listen, I just respect the science. We don't know everything, but what we do know, we should know and not try to unknow it and, mm -hmm. and explore, you know, explore the next thing. You just can't make things um, into something, and I respectfully say this, wooey, <laughs> if it's not. Yeah. yeah. And, if, and I'm a, you know, I tend to be a wooey person, too, by the way. But um, if you can explain it in a way, you can't. It's no yeah. magic. There's a huge amount of concern about uh, global warming and climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether the global warming is man-made or it's not, whether it's something that needs to be resolved by human beings or if it doesn't, if the problems are going to continue and... You know, does it mean this or that or the other thing? And people are taking sides, and a lot of people who are taking sides are the ones who are making a lot of money by messing up the planet, and they want to keep being able to make the money, and they think that the planet will take care of itself. And that's where the disagreements come from. And the interesting part is, and some scientists did this decades ago, the question is, do you believe that mankind is taking more resources out of the Earth's crust than are being replaced? And everybody says yes. So the discussion is about what does that mean? What are the implications? And how long is that going to last? And it's a different conversation. It's because everybody believes that. Everybody believes that. There's a story of um, when the railroad companies uh, were faced with the automobile. It's like, uh oh. And some of them wanted to fight the automobile. And oh, there's going to be trucks that are available and eventually the interstate system. And then there's going to be airplanes. And. The railroad companies that did really well are the ones that visioned themselves as transportation companies instead of just as railroads. Because when you put yourself into the box, if I'm a railroad company, then I gotta fight everything that's not the railroad. If I make buggy whips, then the horseless carriage is a threat to my security. Mm -hmm. And if I say, I'm gonna make steering wheel covers instead, <laughs> you know, or automotive upholstery, it's an opportunity to diversify, get into something different and continue sharing the gifts and the, the talents that we have, but to do it in a different direction. There is sometimes such a hesitation for an energy company to think of itself as an oil and gas company instead of an energy company. I mean, there are other ways to make energy. And by the way, <laughs> they all still have a lot to do with taking resources out of the planet and using them for something. They're just not burning them. A little more clever to make solar panels or lithium ion batteries. And, okay, that discussion comes up in a lot of ways. Uh, it's AI now. It's the mm -hmm. same thing. And, you know, for a hot minute, I got a little, you know, a little angst about the AI thing because, look, I'm a writer, and now you're telling me that, you know, whatever. But then I thought about the, all of the the evolution of humankind and and productivity and all of that those things happen periodically you know those there's going to be something new that just means that we're progressive we're moving forward and this that i thought for a second was threatening me is not threatening me at all it's 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 a tool that will be useful to a lot of other people who need it and it's like the computer that was the devil <laughs> when it first came <laughs> nothing's gonna happen you know you're gonna go to the devil and it's gonna put the i won't go into it but now we can't even imagine life without those little tiny computers called a telephone yeah so I, the screens I that we at, have to stare at and waste our life on oh yeah and so i looked at 
uh, AI the same way, it's it's a mark of progression. It's just a movement, and you can. It takes nothing from me. In fact, um, helps me think a little better sometimes. Actually, when I stop mm-hmm. feeling threatened. So, uh, <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, I'm really resonating with you about seeing something from a positive lens. How can I use this? Because everything is God. I, I look at AI as a gift. Not only has it been here forever, and we just didn't think of it that way. Uh, it's just been given stepping forward with a, a title that's unfamiliar to us. But everything is God. It's a gift that God has given us, an expression of God's intellect. And don't get me started on that. When I thought about that, I said, whoa, this is really good. And that's what made me look at it even more. You know, to see, well, listen, how can I use God in my stuff a little better? Maybe this is a gift to me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and there's definitely something there. And we're starting to talk about that on on Sunday mornings in our celebration. Uh, There are a couple of observations that I have about AI. And the first one is the, the big thing in AI now is the large language models where they take lots and lots of data and they feed it into these things and let it cross tabulate everything and figure stuff out based on other things that have happened. And there are two areas that particularly have me concerned. Now, actually there are three. Uh, One of them is that the people who own the intellectual material that's getting consumed by these large language models, like the New York times, because they have some authoritative stuff to say and, you know, encyclopedias and dictionaries is just get read into these things and, and used. Uh, they say, oh, wait a second. <laughs> That's copyrighted. And uh, it's not that you can't use it. It's just that, like we put a lot of effort into making that. So when are we going to get something out of it? When are we going to get a credit for it? Uh, and that's been just dismissed uh, up until now. Um, the other thing is... <clears throat> Because they need a lot of data, there's this idea amongst the AI companies that they can use the data that the AI systems have generated as data to feed into the AI systems. Wait a second, you're going to connect your own output to your own input (laughs) and just let it run itself down a rabbit hole? Uh, And the third one is, and as I, I keep hearing promos for this on companies that are selling their AI technology to companies, hallucination free. Now, a hallucination is basically what happens when AI gets an idea and then runs with it. And it's something that never had anything to do with truth, but because there's enough other stuff in its database that it convinces itself that it's a good idea, and then that becomes the output that it has. And, oh, by the way, if you're training the AI system on its own output, then the hallucinations are just going to get more and more vivid. So all of that stuff comes together so that I, on the one hand, completely agree with you that AI is just another tool and it's another way that this is going to unfold And if we tap the brakes a little bit and say, what are we actually doing here? Then instead of insisting that the the solar eclipse is God's punishment for us, and it's the way of being reminded that all of the good can be taken away from us, and instead say, no, it's just a solar eclipse, it's going to (laughs) pass. We're in a better position. Well, first of all, uh, you are using, you're asking a lot of human beings. Stop, That's me. Slow down and think. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking a whole lot. And that's a whole nother, uh, you know, podcast. And the reason why I would say it's a whole nother podcast because it can sound a little bit offensive. And, and I really am not trying to do that. But things move so quickly and people are demanding things that move quick. We are accustomed to that. We're not accustomed mm-hmm. to slowing down thinking about the implications of this, that, and the other thing. Uh, it's, it will flush itself out, not to say that it's not something to be concerned about, but you are so miles ahead of anybody else being concerned about that. And I'm looking, I'm hearing people, listen, I'm hearing people talk about the use of it to me in a way that lacks integrity mm-hmm. and all the rest of that, and I'm thinking, what is wrong with you? Don't you? People don't. <laughs> they don't think. You know, authenticity doesn't matter. It's how you can use it. You know, one. Uh, this is just a really quick story. I was looking at one of the uh, 
YouTube things. Where, you know, everybody wants to teach you how to be a millionaire in about 20 minutes. And this, this one guy uh, produced 30 books. You know, he's a, an author of 30 books. And I'm thinking, first of all, you ain't been on the planet long enough to have written 30 books. And, uh, sir, I can see there's no genius here we're talking to. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so people are just, you know, eating this up. And I'm thinking, nobody's thinking. But he's smart enough to know that people don't think. Mm -hmm. And they can just, you. so, you know, what are you going to do? You, you just have to wait until it just flushes itself out because, you know, just a moment's thought would tell you that this person is not producing 30 books. And then if you look at the books, even on camera, they don't look like they've been <laughs> properly edited. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I spent a fair amount of time in my career doing consulting work. And there's a tongue-in-cheek comment that consultants had, which is, if you're not going to be part of the solution, there's good money to be made by prolonging the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break you, and then you know I'm a... going to look at that when we get finished. <laughs> Let's take a break and we'll do a prayer about solar eclipses, earthquakes, and artificial intelligence. Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy to understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b-the-light.com. That's b dash the dash light dot com. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. I don't know right before we the break, I, I, I gave you the tongue in cheek saying that we had in the consulting business. And it was actually not something that we believed in. It's just a, one of those things that goes around because sometimes it's a little too close to home. And that was if you're not going to be part of the solution, there's good money to be made prolonging the problem. And if you look at it, that's, that's so true. That's so true. If I can stand here saying, this is a problem, this is an emergency, this is something that has to be dealt with immediately, then I get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Then I get a lot of attention and I can turn that attention into whatever the coin of the realm happens to be. If it's Facebook followers or YouTube subscribers or advertising sales or uh, people sitting with me for a session to read their tea leaves or whatever it is. If I, if I can frighten somebody enough to think mm. that they need to snap into action by buying whatever it is that I'm selling, then that's the game. And the important part is that doesn't need to be the game. We can do a different game. When there is a solar eclipse, that means something but it doesn't mean that we're being punished with darkness in the middle of the day. What it means is the earth and the sun are and the moon are moving in such a way that the moon is getting between the earth and the sun and there's a shadow. And that's what we experience as an eclipse. When an earthquake happens, it's because we are living in the city of the damned and it's being shaken by the infinite power that creates everything. Or, the tectonic plates are slipping and we feel it as an earthquake. And sometimes there's a lot of destruction and sometimes there's just big stories and people saying, did you hear that? Did you feel that? Same thing with artificial intelligence. In and of itself, it's neither good nor bad. However, the stories that we tell about it and the way that we engage with it can be. So the important part in all of this, the big umbrella, the overriding picture, what we can take into prayer is to invite each of these to be an unfolding of good 
highest and best unfolding with love and ease for everyone who's involved. And it's showing up as artificial intelligence. It's showing up as an experience of a solar eclipse, giving us an opportunity to become more introspective, to learn something either about ourselves or about our world that we didn't know before. To have an earthquake remind us of what's important. And perhaps as a suggestion that when we're building something to don't just think about having the thing standing there on a nice sunny day, maybe let's consider what's going to happen if there's a storm, what's going to happen if there's an earthquake, what happens if there's a fill in the blank, so that we are being good stewards of the resources that we have and supporting that experience that we're desiring instead of just assuming that it's going to be there. So let's pray by turning our attention away from the world around us. Have your own little personal eclipse by letting your eyes close or go to a soft focus. And look at that. Suddenly the light goes away. It's still there, but we're not aware of it. But we can be more fully aware of that divine power and presence that is there, that's always there, that's showing up in the bright light, that's showing up in the shadows and the darkness, that's showing up in every activity and every moment. There is only that love. There is only... Only that one infinite power and presence, that one divine substance, that that infinite creative power is sharing and revealing and expressing and unfolding through and as all of its creation. Everything is that one divine presence, that one limitless substance expressed in its own way. That everything includes me and each person who is within the sound of my voice. Each one, an individualized expression of that one infinite love, that divine energy, that infinite intelligence, that limitless love expressed in a unique and wonderful and personal way. And I know that, that as that creative power continues to share itself, to evolve and unfold itself, it does so in a manner that brings more love, more prosperity, more harmony and balance, more health and vitality, more comfort and love, more sweetness and richness, creativity and goodness into our lives. And the good news is there is nothing that stands in the way of this. The experience of an eclipse crossing our path can be one of fear or can be one of wonder and insight and invitation. So I choose to be aware of love unfolding, new possibilities in every circumstance. The ones that are obviously good we allow them to express as good. And the ones that seem so challenging that we would normally Im immediately and instinctively define as bad or challenging or difficult or wrong or undesirable, there's a gift in there as well. Because when the darkness comes, we get to see the light return. A transformation that is not possible without the darkness. And with this in mind, I know that love is unfolding, that goodness is at hand for each of us in our own way. I'm grateful for the good that's coming about. I'm grateful for the willingness of each one who is listening now to be able to let go of attachment to thinking that we already know how this is going to go, that we already know how this is coming out, to open to something new and wonderful. I'm grateful for that willingness, and I'm grateful for the awareness of the love. And I am grateful to be able to speak this word and release it into that creative law that creates everything. And to know without question, doubt, hesitation, or delay that this good is happening now. And so I let it be. I speak this word and I let it be. And so it is. The Practical Prayer Podcast with Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Reverend Bill's classes in practical spirituality at newthoughtphilly.org. Practical Prayer Podcast, episode number 148 on Eclipse Day. 148. 148. This sounds like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you know that number? That number means a lot to me in a lot of ways. That means 148 I came does? up with 100. Well, no, each week. Okay. Each week, the number. Yeah, because that means that you, you gave me the assignment when we started. 
that I'll come up with a subject. Mm-hmm. And I, I have come up with, let's see, 148. Well, if we factor in the times that I probably called in sick, something like that, which hasn't been a lot. It's only been two or three, yeah. Yeah, so maybe I came up with 140 subjects to, to talk about. Yeah, I think and, it's even more than that. And when I when I was first thinking about doing this podcast, I could think of maybe a dozen. So you sub- subtract out my 12, and you know, even though I never did them, you're like 130, 140 ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know, you can just look. It depends on how you look at things. You could say that, look at how much you were able to just do, you know, because we don't meet earlier in the week and go through it for an hour or two and say, what do you think? And we never get like on the same page in advance. We just show up Mm -hmm. and, you know, you, you pull it off. Now, (laughs) (laughs) so there's a lot of ways to look at that, right? You could say, well, you know, you pull it off. You're brilliant. I am, you know, I'm quite wooey. So I think that spirit <laughs> knows ahead of time and gets in there and shuffles it up and makes sure we <laughs> make sense because spirit knows that the one thing I hate is public embarrassment. So I, I know spirit will get in here and stir it up in my head so I don't say nothing dumb. <laughs> okay. well, amen to that. Amen to that. And um, yeah, there's... <laughs> One of my talents seems to be um, responding in the moment to these things, and I was noticing that. I mean, we've been we've been talking about that. I've started. I do these meditations on uh, on Zoom uh, twice a day. There's twelve times a week, and the group gets together on Zoom and kind of comes up with a topic, and then we do a meditation on that. And I do a meditation on that, and it turns out that's something that that's just easy for me. And we've started doing them on Insight Timer on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. And people are astounded that we'll start a conversation and I'll be able to do a five-minute meditation based on something I had no idea about before. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the Practical Prayer Podcast is you tell me what the subject is right before we start, sometimes while we start, depending on if we forget to talk ahead of time. (laughs) And... We just, we talk about it and it works. And that either means that I am wonderful and completely gifted at responding in the moment, or I'm horrible at preparing. (laughs) (laughs) I refuse to do my homework and I figure out how to ad lib my way through it. And I'll, I'll go with the first one, but it's possible it's the second one. Well, it works, whichever way it is, you know, it, it works. We had a film screening yesterday. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a film called Angels and Saints, Eros and Awe, and it's about the intersection between religion and sexuality. And it was on our, at our Sunday morning, morning venue, which is the Falser Club in East Falls in Philadelphia. And we invited the community to come in, and there's going to be a panel discussion with the producer of the movie and the director of the movie and me and another minister from the East Falls area. And I thought, great, I'll be on that panel. And then after the movie was over, they said, so you're moderating the panel, right? I go, okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Sure. Sure. (laughs) Not mentioning that I wasn't expecting to be moderating the panel, but between the time that they asked me to moderate the panel and the time that we started the panel, I had a couple of minutes and I figured out a few questions and some more came to me during the, the thing. And afterwards, people told me it was great. And it's like, okay. I wonder what it would have been like if I'd known ahead of time. Maybe I just would have gotten nervous. I have no idea. Hmm. But just hmm. like being present, and, all right, we'll make it work. <laughs> and I seem to have not embarrassed you or me or others. So we'll, we'll, we'll go for that's good. Well, the word genius comes to mind. Oh, my. Uh, and we'll, we'll let you wrestle with that a bit. <laughs> Uh, uh, one more thing, I just wanted to remind everybody who is uh, interested, uh, who is watching the recording on New Thought Media Network, that if you have a question or a comment or a, a um, prayer request that you'd like to make, you can go to the website, be the light.com, be-the-light.com, and we would be happy to take that under advisement for a future episode. In the meantime, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you are anywhere in the path of the eclipse, go watch and don't look straight at it. <laughs> Please help us say thank you to our organizational sponsors, including the Hefferlin Foundation, Affiliated New Thought Network, International New Thought Alliance, Science of Mind Archives and Library Foundation, Center for Spiritual Living Denver, Center for Spiritual Living Midtown, New Thought Philadelphia, Planned Happiness Institute, Summit Center for Spiritual Living, One Heart Retreats, Center for Spiritual Living on the Lake, Unity Kitchener, Unity Spiritual Center, Ottawa, Ohm Center for Spiritual Living, Satya Center, Begin Within Ministries, Center for Spiritual Living, North Jersey, Unity of Savannah, and the Center for Spiritual Living, Seattle, as well as all of our individual donors. Thank you for being part of the New Thought Media Network. Please like, share, and subscribe. New Thought Media Network, positively inspiring.